Bang & Olufsen TV. The model is the BO Vision Avant 2. I had the opportunity to pick this up. I only had to travel a couple of K away to get it, so I couldn't pass that up. It's pretty rare that I get a SCART TV anywhere near home. This model debuted in 1998 and concluded in 2001. Uh, it, the manufacturing date is 97, so this is a very early one. It has a CRT for a screen. It's a 32 inch widescreen curved. So it's pretty pretty early on for widescreen TVs back in 97. I think B&O debuted in 96 with widescreen. Uh, it's on its own stand. That's all built in. It doesn't come apart or anything. It stands reasonably high, but not too high. It's on a motorized stand that will rotate. It has 35 degrees of rotation. I'll demonstrate that shortly. Uh, the screen refresh rate is 100 hertz as well, unfortunately. But we'll see how that goes. It does have um, a few eyebrow raising things, you know, a few interesting things about it. Uh, it has a built in VCR which is here, here's the flap where you insert your VHS tapes you can swivel it set by hand freely you are pushing against the motor to do that but I'll show you it shortly up top here there is a little dot matrix display you can see the time on there and some Dolby information there the colour is pearlescent blue like many B&Os, they come in various colours. Let's go to the side and have a look. It has a very um, somewhat thin, thin profile. Try to go for a very sleek look there on the back, and you can see that more so here, where the neck board of the tube would be. They've really tried to take the plastic in as close to the tube as possible and keep the thing slim. On the back, here's the controls for channel up and channel down and eject, rewind, so forth. Um, a set of inputs there. Oh yeah, it's got S video there. Composite and headphones. Moving on down. It does have some good recessed handles in it to carry the thing. The thing weighs 80 kilos. It's not mega heavy. Of course, being Bang & Olufsen European, you're going to expect to find some SCART sockets on the back. So what we've got here, in fact, are uh, three scarts. The satin's plugged into the first one, number two and number three. Here's a little cable reclaiming, reclaiming clamp that you can fasten cables to. Um, there's like four DIN-looking connectors there. They're actually for Bang & Olsen speakers. You can put some surround sound speakers to this TV. And down here we've got RF in and RF out, that's a bit odd, RF out. I've tried hooking that up to another TV but I couldn't get anything out of it. Um, there's like a special B&O connector. I think that goes to like a B&O sound system and might go to an amp or something. Actually looks like the connector on a GameCube, the digital output, but it won't be. Now, um, you know, three SCARTs is pretty good. That's, that's about as much as you get on any TV, but this did freak me out a bit when I saw this going lower down. That there's actually another two SCART sockets down here at the bottom. So on the back of the TV there's a total of five, which is bloody quite unprecedented. You know, as a game, the more consoles you get, the more connections you need. And any you can get away as a bonus, but to have five SCARTs is just simply unheard of. But there is a catch to that, and I believe that those two down there are really... Um, for the VCR, they're not so much further inputs, but I'll get into that and explain that a bit more shortly. All right, I'll take the back off. The back actually, all, all the screws in the TV are like a Torx security screw. B and A like to use the Torx stuff, but once you've undone these, and it's it's pretty easy to take the back cover off. Actually, it's good. Okay, with the back off, there's the big big part of the back shell there and there's the bottom part which covers around the VCR section I didn't show you before here's the label made in 97 if my Roman numeral reading is correct 
Uh, the type there is 84 slash 25, which is the Australian model. So this is a proper Australian delivered model made in Denmark. A Dolby logo down there. I should also show you before I forget, there's the BO4 remote. A very well known remote. It's probably worth more than the TV is itself. And there it is with its little LCD screen. The manual. Here it is. Nice when the owners keep those. And here it is with its back cover off. Um, there's some controls here. They're accessible, of course, as I showed you before with the cover on. Now, it's pretty dusty inside. It's actually a bit dirty on the outside. I haven't cleaned it. Um, here's the chassis down here, and it's sort of uh, a U-shaped chassis standing vertically to try and save some space. Fairly crammed in there. This um, backboard here, the one with the DIN sockets for sound, definitely is a sound thing. And there's a chip there with the Dolby logo on it. Further down is the VCR area. This has this metal shielding on it. I'm not going to take that off. I think it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, there's a lot of cables and things further inside there that, that will get in the road of that shielding coming out, so I'm not going to bother. And then there's those two scarts down below again for the VCR. The Beano has four speakers, two on each side. There you can see one, two. They're rated at 39 watts each, so it fairly cranks the sound out as the Beano's do. There's an amp there on one side and another amp on the other side to power the left side of speakers, presumably, or the right side if you're on the front. As for the tube itself, surprisingly, the tube doesn't readily give its details. It doesn't have its manufacturing sticker on it, which is strange. It's never, I've never seen a tube without a label before, but it does actually have it here, and B&O, for some reason, have decided to cover it up. So if we peel it back, we are revealed with a Philips tube, 76 centimeter, made in Germany. Now as to why they've covered it up, I can only guess, and I would imagine it is because people are paying 4,000 odd pounds or so for the B&O, the luxury brand B&O, and yet we've only got a sort of common everyday um, Philips tube inside. I, I don't think B&O want you to know that. That's, that's why I reckon it's covered up. Not that there's anything wrong with Philips tubes, and Philips makes some really good tubes, but I just feel that's what B&O may have done in this case. I think a lot of these little luxury or smaller luxury brand TV manufacturers like Lerber Metz and Grundig and B&O, they weren't big enough companies really to manufacture their own CRT, so they had to outsource them all the time, and, and that's what simply has happened. Anyhow, put that back on. That's pretty much for it inside. Let's have a look at it, what it actually looks like. With a lot of 100 hertz refresh rate TVs, you can tell just by looking at the snow that's in front of us, whether it's 100 hertz or 50, you can just tell by the, just by the look of it. I'm not so sure with this one here. Now it is definitely 100 hertz in refresh rate, but the snow doesn't look as bad, I suppose you could say, as some other 100 hertz jobs out there. So. It can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, from model to model. Some have heavier processing than, than others. Some of them are lighter. Like I believe the B&A here is pretty light with its 100 hertz stuff and digital processing, whatever else it does. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't look as good as a classic 50 or 60 hertz TV. Anyway, to help confirm whether it was 100 hertz or not, I um, put on Virtual Cop, as you would have seen at the start of the video. A light gun game for the Saturn, and I'll put that on now. So, here's the Sega Saturn gun, official Japanese one. Game is Virtual Cop 2. I'm going to start it. This gun is working 100%. I tested it on a 50-60Hz monitor yesterday. Now, I can shoot. Sometimes a shot registers, but it doesn't register as to where I aimed it. See that? I cannot, cannot hit him whatsoever. Definitely not working. 
100 hertz, no good. Now while we're here, I'll make mention that there is no way to turn the picture into a 4.3 mode. I can't shrink in the sides and get a nice original 4.3 display as this game was intended. I can't find any way to do that. There's no mention of it in the manual. In fact, the online literature for the B&O says that it will fit all inputs, all sources to a widescreen mode. So you're forced into widescreen. So I think that's a bit lousy too. We'll try the VCR and see how that goes. Digging deep, looking for VHS tapes. I found an old He-Man tape. So that'll do it for a test sample. Put that in. It goes in, so it's looking good. Looks like it works. So far, so good. Now, when I played with the TV before to see how it all worked, I could not for the life of me get any picture on the screen from the videotape. I've just changed it onto V-tape mode, and I thought, why are we not getting any picture or sound? And here's, here's the, where things get a bit funny. Well, let's go around the back. Now, sorry for the bad lighting before. Um, I've got a headlamp on now. So there's the two scarts from the VCR. Now, you knew things are too good to be true to have five true inputs in the back. As I said, I couldn't get picture from the VCR, so I just tried various things, and I suspected that one of these scarts, or maybe both, had to be hooked up to one of the other scars to get picture on the VCR, and it's correct. So what I've got here is just a scart to scart ended cable. I can't remember if it's the if it's the bottom or the top scart, but I'm going to put it in that bottom one, and then into the third scart on the back. I'm going to turn the satin off for a sec too, because I don't want any interference. So there we go, it's working now. I've got sound and I've got picture and He-Man's um, showing. The VCR is working and everything's right, but... I'm turn the volume down. Um, so basically you've got, to, you've got to hook that VCR up to the TV externally. I don't know why the VCR wasn't integrated better with the TV itself. It, it's like B&O decided, look, we're going to make this model. We're going to put a TV and a VCR in a shell together, but we're not really going to fully integrate them. We're not going to hardwire the VCR up into the TV. Instead, you've got to use a cable from out the back and plug it, plug each one in. So, I don't know, it's a bit of a letdown, a bit of a disappointment, I think. And the theory I'm going with on the two scarts on the VCR is that the bottom one is output to go into the TV so you can watch whatever you want from the VCR. And my other theory on that scar is that that is an input into the VCR for recording purposes. So you would capture an output somewhere from the TV and go to the input and record whatever. That's the theory I'm going with. I don't really care, to be honest. I, don't, I think it's probably going to be a very limited use, whatever it does. So... That's how that works. Now, another thing that's not uncommon to TVs out there is that not all input sources are discrete with one another. If I turn the satin on now while the VCR is operating, we may get some interference. Yes, we do. We get a blank screen as a result. I'll switch it onto the satin. And the satin's coming through all right. But if we go back to video tape we get sound but no picture oh no we're getting a little bit of picture there it's a bit a bit intermittent with its picture we can actually further add to that by plugging uh plugging a playstation in as well into the second scart having it turn on at the same time which causes more interference it's not completely unusual for tvs to do that but I would have expected B and O to really make each and every input completely discrete and not interfere with one another. I'd have to say, out of all the TVs I've seen, this B and O though, the 100 hertz refresh rate, the processing behind it, is the most minimum that I've ever seen. It almost looks 50 or 60 hertz in appearance, but it's still 
it still doesn't look as good as a classic Virtua Cop 2 before. It was in RGB. Scart Socket 1 does accept RGB. I don't know about Scart 2 and 3. Manual doesn't mention anything about RGB details, but at the end of the day, it still doesn't look crash hot. It's not fantastic. So, you know, don't worry about it too much. I'm just going to finish off this review by showing you a few more things. I want to show you the menu system and I want to show you the rotation. Menu's fairly basic. Fairly basic. We'll go down to set up there, number four, and go to the stand. All right? And then I can. Yeah, I'll get this going. There we go. She's rotating now. That's um, that's the B and I'm not pushing that. That's operating by its own motor, and I must say the motor is very quiet, very smooth, and very quiet. Nice little gimmick. Again, the menu system is is fairly basic. There's not much else to it. So you know that's pretty much it. Like I didn't chase down this B and O, but it came by my way pretty easily, so I couldn't miss doing a review of it. Uh, I can't see really any purpose for it at all. Um, it's it's picture quality. It's still not as good as the classic. You'd be better off with the MX seven thousand if you wanted a B and O. So you know, yeah, nothing nothing really to nothing really to recommend it. But there it is. Now I'm sorry I haven't put any videos out for a while. I do have a few more to to make and put out. So just keep an eye on the channel. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.